If there is anyone who has dollars, euros, or gold under their pillows, they should go exchange it for liras at our banks. Turkey's president says his country is fighting an economic war and the new finance minister outlines plans to boost growth. But the lira plunges even further to a new record low. And adding to the pressure, the US has doubled tariffs on steel and aluminium imports from Turkey. President Donald Trump says relations with Turkey are not good. But for some, the fall in the lira is something of a blessing. We meet the Turkish marble exporters, carving out a niche for themselves in the global market. Hello, I'm Azhar Sukri. This is a Turkey Economy special edition of Money Talks. Turkey has unveiled the framework for a new economic approach. Finance and Treasury Minister Berat Albayrak says the country needs to change to become an upper income economy. But the measures are also a response to the rising trade tensions and a steep decline in the Turkish lira. On Friday, the currency hit an all time low against the dollar, weakening nearly 14% during the day. Mobin Nasser reports. Turkey has set a goal to become a developed country with a high income economy. To achieve it, it's adopted a new economic approach. Treasury and Finance Minister Berat Albayrak says it's one that will be decisive, sustainable and strategic. Another of our main principles is to establish full independence of monetary policy. I refrain from talking about the central bank as much as I can, and when I have to speak, I use sensitive language. The central bank's independence should always continue as a principle. Its independence is very important. Reinforcing financial stability will be one of our high priority targets. The government's plan has three phases. The first aims to secure a growth rate of 3 to 4% next year. It includes reducing the trade deficit and inflation to single digits. The second phase is about healthy and sustainable growth. It aims to simplify the tax system and to boost production, mainly in high-tech industries. Phase three is based on fair distribution of incomes, reducing unemployment and developing a more equitable tax system. Albayrak has stressed the independence of the central bank, but the government will also play its role by reducing its budget and trade deficits and its dependence on loans. Its key priority, however, is to reduce inflation, which hit 16% last month. While inflation rose slower than analysts expected, it's still well above the central bank's target of 5%, and concerns over double-digit inflation have cost the lira more than a third of its value this year. But more than that, it's tensions with the US that have weighed heavily in recent days. Adding to the pressure, President Donald Trump says the US will double its steel and aluminum tariffs on Turkey. While Trump is known to try to use tariffs to force other countries to make concessions, Turkey says it won't bow to pressure. If there's anyone who has dollars, euros or gold under their pillows, they should go exchange it for liras at our banks. This is a national and domestic battle. This will be my people's response to those who have waged an economic war against us. The new economic plan is the government's most comprehensive response yet to its economic challenges. But it will need the collective efforts of the private sector, academia and the general public to turn its fortunes around. Mubin Nasir, TRT World, Istanbul. So as we heard there, President Erdogan has told Turks not to worry about the tumbling lira, but how confident are people that the government can improve the outlook? There are economic fluctuations, but we shouldn't be pessimistic. The economic problems are the outcome of trade wars, and I think it's only temporary. Nobody is happy with the current situation, but I think we will overcome the hardships of this period. We should consume domestic goods. We should demonstrate a calm attitude. Let's refrain from buying imported goods. We should raise people's consciousness. 
So let's bring in our guests. Joining me here in the studio is Taha Arvas. He's a financial columnist at the Daily Saban newspaper. In London is Timothy Ash. He's an emerging market senior sovereign strategist for Blue Bay Asset Management and TRT World's editor-at-large, Craig Peters, joins us from Paris. But Taha, I want to start with you. Welcome to you all, by the way. Taha, Thank I you. want to start with you first. Um, from where I'm sitting, there are two sets of issues facing Turkey. There's the long-term set of issues and there's the short-term. Um, from <clears throat> Minister al -Bayrak's speech today, I think he focused a lot on the longer-term structural issues, but did he do enough to address these pressing short-term issues of the lira, the current account deficit, inflation? Uh, I don't think the uh, speech today, the presentation today was... Uh aimed at the volatility we've seen in the last two days. Uh, I think the markets may have expected it to be more in response to those uh, changes. Um, perhaps I think it was more aimed at the audience, both in the room that he was in, uh, the leaders of uh, uh, many public companies in Turkey, and the broader uh, audience at home saying that the Turkish government will listen to investors and uh, business leaders more than it has in the past. That's what I think it was aimed at. Okay. Uh, Tim, let me bring you in uh, next. Um, from your foreign investors' point of view, do you think the finance minister's statement earlier today, um, is that going to do much to uh, bring in the foreign, kind of foreign investment that is going to be needed to plug that current account deficit? I'm afraid not really. It was very disappointing. al has been in office for a month. Uh, there was not really any detail. I mean, yesterday we had a statement in terms of, uh, which was kind of positive in terms of, you know, targeting to reduce the fiscal deficit this year to 2% of GDP from probably it's going to be 3 if there's no action taken and then 1.5 next year and hoping, targeting a 4% current account deficit, I guess, next year and then this 100% rollover target in terms of domestic debt. I mean, that was fine. That was published yesterday. But we wanted fine detail. We wanted really specific information as how to al -Barak is how Al-Barak is going to deliver on those targets. I mean, from a foreign perspective, looking at Turkey, unfortunately, uh, there's been, you know, a string of policy errors in the last year, particularly in terms of monetary policy. You know, why should we really trust Turkish policymakers to deliver on fiscal targets, for example, when the central bank has consistently, over a decade, missed inflation targets? I mean, you know, 5% inflation target this year, the last print was 15.9. It's probably going to 20%. So. You know, there was just no detail in terms right. of actually what is going to be delivered okay. in terms of the specifics to reduce the budget deficit. There were some promises in there, though, that uh, obviously were aimed at the foreign investor, uh, in particular the independence of the central bank. He stressed that quite, quite a bit. He talked about bolstering the stability of the financial sector, balancing the budget. Um, did any of these resonate with you? Look... I think investors are so frustrated now, particularly with the Central Bank of Turkey. You know, July the 24th, it was a no-brainer. Inflation had risen 300 basis points uh, in June. The, the data was suggested rates had to go higher, mm. and they didn't raise interest rates. It was right. a huge error. Right. And the reason with the currency is where it is at the moment is because the Central Bank didn't do what it had to do. Okay. Now, we can talk about independence of the central bank. The reality is the central bank of Turkey has not raised interest rates when right. it should have done. It should have, it should have been proactive. If it had been proactive and six months ago, ago raised interest rates, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be having to raise rates. Okay. You know, 500 basis points that, that we're talking about are very, very frustrating. Right. Craig, let me bring you in here. Um, what's your reaction to that? Well, whatever one's opinion of the foreign minister's PowerPoint presentation, presentation on the future of the Turkish economy, <clears throat> direct foreign investment and forex rates are largely based on the investment grade the big three ratings agencies give Turkey, which are right now subpar junk. My question here is, how does the government, how did this PowerPoint presentation intend to improve Turkey's credit worthiness uh, to the point where they're going to get that much needed investment to take care of their uh, current account deficit, right. uh, regenerate the, uh, the lira, and more importantly, if they can't get it from the West, 
Okay. Where are they going to go to get right. it? Those are my questions. Uh, Taha, let me put that to you. Where could Turkey turn to? What I've seen recently in, the, in recent weeks, recent months, actually since Donald Trump and even before that have come in, have uh, been sworn in, is that the United States, it seems, and some of the European Union are pushing Turkey away from the West. I mean, they're doing everything they can uh, to push the 70-year-old NATO ally into the arms, frankly, of Russia and China and the East. Um, and today you saw this, you know, this plummeting ruble um, and the Russians are <coughs> at it with the United States. You know, we've, we've heard of collusion and, and Trump working with Russia, but on the surface it looks like anything but. So in that estimation, if you're seeing this cold shoulder from Turkey, from the United States, uh, who else does Turkey have to turn to but its neighbors? Mm. Um, and so if it has no choice, it has no choice. Okay. Uh, we're going to come back to you all. Don't go away, everyone. We will have uh, more reaction in a second because earlier we caught up with some of the business leaders who were at that presentation, presentation at the finance minister's uh, speech earlier today uh, on the country's new economic program. The president of the Independent Industrialists and Businessmen's Association, Abdurrahman Khan, for example, says he is confident the proposed steps will put the Turkish economy on the path to stability and growth. Turkey is a very strong country. We have overcome economic crisis in 1994, 2001 and 2008. Last year we were the fastest growing economy in the OECD. And as we heard in the finance minister's presentation today, we will focus on developing policies for sustainable and strategic growth. Also looking ahead, we will combat inflation without pushing up the taxes. These are important steps for the future and we, as Mossiad, support these measures and the vision of our president. The Turkish public authorities have provided a very clear picture in which they detailed how they will carry out the domestic process. On one hand, they showed they are not afraid of all the speculation made abroad. And we, the business world, yes, we do have certain economic expectations regarding some procedures, but the survival and security of this country and its vital interest comes first. Therefore, if needed, even if we have to pay a certain price as a nation, we are committed to keep the general economic structure stable. Now, it has, in fact, been a turbulent few years for Turkey's economy, with the lira setting record after record for all-time lows. And it's as much about politics as it is about economics. Now, in July 2016, the Turkish lira suffered its biggest one-day drop in eight years. It fell as much as 6% after an attempted coup caused a sell-off of Turkish assets. In December of that year, OPEC agreed to limit oil supplies, signaling higher prices for Turkey's import-dependent economy. In the previous two months, the lira had shed 15% of its value against the dollar. More than a year later, in January 2017, the lira fell 1.5% after worse than expected inflation data and a terrorist attack on New Year's Day in Istanbul. In May of this year, the lira hit 4.22 against the dollar after data showed inflation hit a five-month high of nearly 11%. And just 12 days later, the lira fell to 4.43 against the dollar after President Recep Tayyip Erdogan promised to take greater control of monetary policy if he won the presidential election in June. And this month, the lira hit what was a record low of 5.11 to the dollar after the US announced sanctions on Turkey's interior and justice ministers. The sanctions were imposed in response to Turkey's detention of an American pastor on terror charges. Since then, the lira has continued to weaken as some investors think it may only be the beginning of punitive actions against Turkey. And Turkey isn't the only one in Trump's line of fire when it comes to sanctions. Russia has warned that if the US follows through with threats to impose further sanctions, it'll be seen as a, quote, declaration of economic war, unquote. It comes after Washington unveiled a raft of new sanctions against Russia over an alleged nerve agent attack in the UK, which the US and the UK blame on Moscow. Russia has denied any involvement. 
If we end up with something like a ban on banking activities or the use of certain currencies, we can clearly call this a declaration of economic war. And we must absolutely respond to this war by economic means, by political means, and if necessary, by other means. Our American friends must understand this. So let's go back to our guest, Daily Sabah columnist Taha Ravas is still with us in the studio. Blue Bay Asset Management Emerging Market Senior Sovereign Strategist Tim Ash is in London and TRT World's editor at large, Craig Peters, is in Paris. Craig, I want to pick up with you next. You and I have talked a lot about the weaponization of the US dollar um, and the fact that Trump has chosen today uh, to double these tariffs on aluminium and steel uh, imports. I suppose, feeds into this narrative that um, Turkey is being besieged, uh, as we've heard in, uh, from Erdogan and Putin today, that there is a war going on. Uh, is there a war going on? Yes, there's been a war going on since the moment Donald Trump was elected president of the United States, as we've reported on Money Talks since that election. It's now ratcheting up. These hyperinflationary missiles have been fired. Uh, now, today, when we had Pre President Erdogan described it wage waging an economic war uh, and Trump saying relations between the U.S. and Turkey aren't good, well, how, how soon is it going to be then when the Incirlik Air Base becomes part of this, part of this argument? Because the U.S. has clearly weaponized the U.S. dollar, and they're not making any apologies for it. And Turkey is correct in, in feeling besieged. There's no doubt about that. But there's one key point here, Azar, okay? Turkey is in the economic doldrums. It needs Western capital. For that capital to come, it has to undergo a rigorous and successful rating by one of the ratings agencies, and they're not going to do that. Now, whether someone wants to brand that a conspiracy or not, I will give them that right to do that. But that is a market reality, which means that Turkey has very few choices left. Mm -hmm. They could go with China. They can't go with Russia. Right. Russia is broke. Right. And the Iranians don't have two reals to rub together. So I don't see how Turkey at this point, based on today's PowerPoint mm. presentation, can get over this hump. OK. Tim, let me bring this back to you. Is the U.S. using the predominance of the dollar to get its way in foreign policy, or is this pure and simple market forces? Look, bottom line is there's faults kind of on both sides. You know, if you, if you look at the Turkish-Western relationship, over the last seven or eight years, I mean, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, right? But in the end, Turkey, unfortunately, Turkey faces this position where two thirds of trade, two thirds of financing, and two thirds of investment comes from the West. Turkey has this big external financing gap, around $230 billion it needs to finance. It doesn't have enough reserves. Uh, as, as was mentioned, Russia is certainly not going to write checks for tens of billions of dollars, and I don't think the Chinese are either. So. You know, there needs to be a normalization in the relationship with the West and with the US, and that needs compromise on both sides. Unfortunately for Turkey, this comes at a very difficult time because lots of different reasons. But, you know, we have Fed tightening. We have lots of focus on countries that have big external finance requirements and policy that are not appropriate. And, you know, it, you know, but in the end, you know, you need to do what you need to do. And unless there is a normalization with the US, unless domestic policy becomes orthodox, and investors can trust in it, then <clears> you're not going to stabilize things. Things are going to get worse. Inflation is going to go mm. higher. The currency is going to go weaker. Yeah. There's going to be pressure on banks, pr pressure on public finances. Yeah. Now, this is a really serious situation that needs action now. Right. You know, it's, it's not a question of a 100-day hundred, hundred program. You need a 100-hour program at the, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, so, so you talked about orthodoxy. It looks like, at the moment, at least, Turkey is not near an orthodox economic program to her. Um, could you see a situation in the not too distant future where perhaps Turkey imposes capital controls? Uh, I don't see that at all. I think that would be the kiss of death for Turkey or for any economy. I, I don't see that at all. But I want to add, uh, speaking on, on Tim and, and Craig's uh, points here, uh, the saving grace for Turkey might be uh, in its uh, two-third of investors that Tim was talking about that invest in Turkey. 
if Turkey goes under, or God forbid, if, any, if, if this currency crisis goes any further, it will, it will ruin all of Europe. This will be the spark, the contagion, that kills the United Kingdom and France, where both Tim and, and Craig are. I mean, their stock exchanges plummeted today. Their currencies, their euro and the sterling, were down heavily, not least because of this fear of contagion from the Turkish lira. Frankly, the United States is, you know, the core inflation just came in way above uh, what it was expected. The United States is one spark. The world is one spark away from another 2008 global recession. And Turkey could be that spark. So mm. I think... Azar, that's, that, that is right. absolutely correct. Yeah. And it goes back to what we've discussed about what collateral damage President Donald Trump is willing to accept right. in this trade war. I think, And that question remains outstanding. Right. OK. I do want to come back to this issue of capital okay. controls, though, because what has started as a whisper is now getting louder in the, in the financial markets. Right. Taha, you said it would be the kiss of death. Tim, right. I want to throw it to you. Capital controls, would it be the kiss of death or is it a possible policy option? Uh, you know, abso absolutely not a policy option. If Turkey goes down that route, it will not get any financing from international capital markets for a very long time. Forget about growth, forget about stabilizing the currency. Uh, very, very bad idea. The positive thing is I think Turkish policymakers and I think Turkish politicians, including President Erdogan, absolutely understand and believe that. And I yes. hope that remains the case. I would just go back and say I don't really agree with this line that, you know, uh, if Turkey goes down, there are going to be glo big global ramifications. Um, I mean, I just don't buy that story. Turkey shouldn't really overplay its hand. I mean, I guess in the, the political battle at the moment with, uh, with the U.S. over Brunson, I mean, I think there's this assumption, for example, that, that you know, Turkey's NATO membership and its NATO linchpin status is really important. I mean, I think you need to realize Trump doesn't care about NATO anymore. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, so his willingness to pressurize Turkey is there, I think, a reflection of, you know, Trump thinks outside the box. And I think it's pretty dangerous at the moment to think that somehow Turkey has leverage in terms of NATO, in terms of global markets. Turkey should just focus on what it can, what, what it can actually do, mm. which is to normalize policy, real right. proper policy. Okay. Central bank, I mean, I'm sorry, but Central Bank of Turkey at the moment is really yeah. not up to task. We need okay. far-reaching changes at the central bank. We, we need orthodox policy, rates need Tim? to go higher, fiscal policy needs to be tightened. Yeah, I'm really sorry, but we are out and of no time. no capital controls. <laughs> and, and no <laughs> capital controls. All right, well, Absolutely we shall see. Not. We are out of time, gentlemen. Timothy Ash of Blue Bay Asset Management. Taha Arvas, Daily Saban, of course, Craig Peters. Thank you all very much indeed. Now, the weaker Turkish lira is driving inflation, but it's helping some industries cash in on higher sales. Turkey's marble producers are on track for record exports this year. Our senior business producer, Mobin Nasser, has been a busy man of late. He recently went to Torbalit in the Turkish province of Izmir, one of the places carving out a larger share in the global market. This is the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was part of the Greek port city of Ephesus, built in the 10th century BC. The ruins left standing in present-day Turkey have survived wars, natural disasters and the rise and fall of several empires. Today, the very same marble used to build these structures is driving the economy of another city not far from here, Torbala. We use cutting-edge technology. We can slice marble blocks that weigh up to 30 tons, like cheese hoops, and bring them from our marble quarries to the factories. We process these blocks into slabs of different sizes. As Turkey, we also export marble processing machines. Turkey has made progress in both the marble industry and marble technologies, so we import only a few of the machineries that we need. So far, 4 billion cubic meters of exploitable reserves have been discovered in the country. These include 650 texture types and colors of marble. Exports increased by 13% in 2017 to reach $2 billion. Businesses in Torbalı, like Izco Marble, expect overseas sales to rise at an even faster pace this year. 
They say a weaker Turkish lira makes their goods more competitive. But Turkey's marble exporters are still leaving some money on the table. Most of the marble being exported from Turkey is in the form of large slabs or tiles like these. But converting them into finished products like furniture fetches a much higher price. And that is what industry leaders are now turning their attention to. They're producing vases, home decor, and entire kitchen sets. But they need more skilled workers to add to their product range. So they're working with universities to offer special courses and they're developing their own technology. Turkey has 38 to 40 percent of the world's proven marble reserves. More importantly, the range of colors is what makes Turkish marble truly special. You can think of any marble color or pattern that exists in the world and you will find it here. More than half of the industry's revenue goes to the state through taxes and the government's playing a role to boost exports by building new highways that connect Torbala to the port in Izmir, making it easier to do business. Didn't you see? Uh, We've really improved our logistics and transportation. We've simplified the processes for reconstruction permits, work permits, waste disposal and other industry-related matters. Now we need to promote our industry all around the world. Marble producers here are investing to increase production. Their products have been popular for thousands of years and they intend to keep pace with demand that only continues to rise. Mubin Nasir, TRT World, Torbala. That's all from Money Talks. Thanks for watching.